On this episode of AvTalk, we sit down with Alon Head, editorial director of EVTall.com, to get a primer on the world of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Hello and welcome to episode 122 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here as always with Jason Urbanowitz. Hello, Ian. How are you? Hello, Jason. I'm doing well, but not as good as you because you have had quite the week, sir. Yeah, well, a day yesterday. I don't know if that equates to a whole week, but I had a fun day yesterday. <laughs> you had quite the 12 minutes in yes. an expansive period of time. So we talked last week about the new or upcoming seaplane service from from New York to to Boston and you got to kind of sort of test it out. Yeah, kind of sort of. I don't remember what my sentiments were about the service when we talked last. Uh, honestly, I don't remember, but they invited me out for a media demo flight. So my, you know, my take on it totally changed for the positive. No, I'm <laughs> kidding about that. But they did invite a lot of media out for some demo flights and it was really, really, really fun. I have been on a seaplane before, but that was... The internet company Row 44, later Global Eagles, uh, Grumman Albatross, which is not really a commercial seaplane. That was, you know, a militarized and later NASA-ized aircraft. But this was a Cessna 208 EX seaplane variant, just a couple years old, uh, first flight in November 2019. So this thing was brand new for, you know, all intents and purposes. And we got to go on a little demo flight. We didn't go all the way to Boston, but we did take off out of... Uh, Manhattan's East 23rd Street Seaport, Skyport. I'm not sure what you call it, but the IATA code is NYS. We took off. We did a little tour of Lower Manhattan. We cut across Central Park and we landed again in the East River. And it was really, really, really cool and fun. And a good time was had by all. Yeah, it, it was great. I mean, the aircraft is, is it's operated by or marketed as Tailwind, I guess. It would be perfectly comfy for a 70-minute flight up to Boston or wherever it is you go. It's expensive. I mean, you, you break down the, the cost per minute, and it is way up there compared to every other way between New York and Boston. But it really is something to, to – I took the bus to the seaport, and then you basically just step on the plane and go because there's only eight passengers and there's no security or anything. But it taking off – on an airplane from the East River really is quite an experience. Well, that I mean, that's good. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm glad it, it went well. And hopefully they, they do well as well, I, I guess. Today's show, we've got a great show because we are sitting down with Alon Head, who is the editorial director of EVTOL.com. She is on top of everything EVTOL, and she will explain what EVTOL is, and we will learn so very much about the new and exciting portion of of aviation to which we we do not know much. But before we get there, we have to talk about a few things. We've got some aircraft orders, we've got Boeing's earnings, which we'll get there, and and some not so great things that are uh, are happening on opposite ends of the US. So Jason, I know that you really wanted to talk about Condor. Yeah, I mean it's it's an aircraft order, and that isn't for like the seven three seven Max or the A three twenty Neo, so that's exciting. But Condor, and I think an exclusive operator of the seven six seven seven six three hundred ER right now, has announced that it got some bailout money and it has promptly ordered sixteen Airbus A three thirty nine hundred Neos, and that actually represents one of the largest orders for the aircraft type. Um, I believe right behind Delta and someone else. Someone else has a bunch of them. But th these are, I'm going to guess, future whitetails. I don't think, what was it, Air Asia had a whole bunch of these planned to uh, join their fleet, which probably isn't going to happen. So it looks like Condor is swooping in and will take its first A330-900 NEO in the fall of 2022 and complete the delivery program by mid-2024, which is a fairly rapid program. 
that's quick. That is yeah. uh, that is quite quick. Yeah. Well, its fleet of seven six sevens is, is not exactly young right now. I think it's the opposite of young. I, I think that's yeah. what we're talking yeah. about here. It has an average age of twenty five point eight, according to Plane Spotters. And when I say exclusive operator of the seven six, I mean as, as far as wide body is that is the only wide body t- type they operate. They do have three twenties and, and seven fives. But uh, as term, in terms of wide body long haul flights, they are exclusively 767's future A330 900 Neo. So refreshing to not see an order that's, you know, for eight 73 Maxes or something like that. <laughs> it's a little more exciting. Yeah. I mean, United's order was exciting, but it's just more narrow bodies. There you go. So let's move to Boeing's earnings, which came out today. And they were, I think- They made money. Better. They were better than people expected, but not not as great as one would have hoped, if you're Boeing, certainly. And some things in there that, that kind of still give, uh, give a little pause, I, I guess you could say. Like what? Well, they, the commercial airplane division is still losing money, but it is helped by the redelivery, or not redelivery, but uh, resumption of deliveries of, of the 737 MAX for sure. But the caution is still the fact that China has not recertified the 737 MAX. And there are a vast number of airplanes that Boeing needs to send to China if they are going to make money on their commercial airplane division. So the yeah, sooner that well, happens, the better. Yeah. Well, deliveries were way, way, way up. Second quarter 2020 to 2021, deliveries of commercial aircraft was up 295%. For the first half overall, it was up 123%. But that's up from basically, you know, zero. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Practically nothing at, at this point in 2020 with uh, the pandemic combined with the 7-3 grounding combined with the 7-8 delivery issues, delivery and manufacturing issues. So things are looking better for Boeing. Not great. Um, they're apparently still not really turning a profit on the 787, a nearly a decade of service. But positive cash flow is good. <laughs> That's a definitely a, a bumper sticker, some sort of maybe sign that I'm going to put up. Yeah, just so well, just so I remember that one. But, positive you know, cash flow, good. Positive, positive cash negative flow, cash flow, flow, bad. There, I appreciate the reminder. So yeah, I mean, good news moving in the right direction. Hopefully, things continue to improve. Hopefully, the seven eight seven quality issues are resolved as quickly as they can be. Hopefully. The 737 MAX is recertified to operate in China, and hopefully Boeing gets the 777X. Progress you know, continues, and all things looking up for them. Jason, tell me more about what's going on at Newark, because you know it's my favorite airport. Well, Newark Airport, an airport famed for its passenger experience and on-time performance, is surprisingly not doing well in the ladder there. So one of the runways, I forget which it is, but I'm sure it starts with a 2-2 or a 4, depending on which way you're approaching it, is out of service for the entire summer due to construction. And I guess the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey really didn't expect the ramp up of uh, domestic travel as much as it has. Since in, in past capital projects like this, both at Newark and JFK, The Port Authority has kind of gathered all of its largest airlines in a room, locked them in there and said, don't come out until you all figure out a plan to reduce flight operations proportionally to not create terrible, terrible, terrible delays. And I guess that just didn't happen this time because they didn't expect there to be damn near normal level or even higher than normal level of flights. So we're seeing quite a dramatic impact on that. Lots of delays day to day. Uh, report from Reuters says United is canceling about 70 of its 240 scheduled flights from Newark per day because of the construction, which is like, I don't know, a third of all flights, which is pretty terrible. But yeah, that, that that's bad. So if you're flying in or out of the Northeast, you, you should probably avoid Newark for the summer. 
I mean, generally, I treat avoiding Newark as sage advice, no matter the time of the year. No matter the time, no matter the day. But we're mentioning this because United is once again urging the federal uh, authorities, which I guess would be the FAA, to act somehow on congestion. But I don't really think you can do that at this point because we're in the middle of the summer and I don't think you're going to see JetBlue voluntarily trim its schedule by 40 flights a day. So not great, but United is pleading with the FAA to do something. But the uh, horse is out of the barn at this point. Ah, uh, the old barn and horse conundrum. Mm-hmm. Hate when that happens. Doors were wide open. And now to the opposite end of the country, we've got a very interesting situation that's developed over the past few weeks especially, but it's been ongoing for, for a little over a month, uh, but become more acute where there are airports that are either running out of or nearly running out of fuel on on the West Coast, partially due to the extremely active wildfire season already, where you need to keep wild fire fighting aircraft fueled. So that's an additional set of demand, but also because of the supply issues that they have because of the lack of qualified tanker drivers and things like that, and, and supply issues coming elsewhere. So it's not a great situation, especially in places like Nevada, where, where you're seeing a lot of trading of, of blame and things like that, whose fault it is, or or making sure that you know certain aircraft have fuel versus other aircraft, and, and making sure that you know the priorities are right. So something we're definitely keeping an eye on. We're hopefully going to have some folks on soon to talk about aircraft fueling in general and fuel supply in general. So I'm looking forward to to that upcoming episode as well. All right. So let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we will talk with Alan Had from evtol.com and learn all about those brand new electric vehicles that will surely be dotting a neighborhood near you any day now. Right, Jason? Spoiler alert, you might want to actually start paying attention. Mm, We'll Mm. be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We are now joined by Alon Head, who is the editorial director of evtall.com. And as promised, we we have found an expert to come and talk to us about evtalls because Jason and I don't really know anything about them other than we've been promised a flying car for as long as we can remember. And as it seems from all of the video renderings we've seen recently, we might be on the cusp of someone finally fulfilling that promise. So to learn more about what they are, what the promise is, and and whether or not we're going to be seeing them flying around cities near you relatively soon, we've invited Alan onto the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Welcome. So Jason and I, as I was kind of describing to you earlier, but before we started recording, to give you an idea of where Jason and I are coming from, we're commercial aviation folk. And so we've seen the eVTOL development mostly from a airlines making orders, United's investment in in some eVTOL manufacturing, as well as UPS, the, the package carrier, being involved in it as well. And so I was hoping that you could take us through kind of, let's start with basically what is eVTOL? Sure. So eVTOL stands for Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing. So basically, it's an aircraft that's electric. It uh, could also be hybrid electric, depending on, on what aircraft you're referring to. And it can take off and land vertically like a helicopter. And so my background is actually in helicopters. This is how I got involved with the whole space. I'm a helicopter pilot and flight instructor. And so when this new generation of vertical lift aircraft started you know, coming into the, the public eye, I naturally started covering it. That's really cool. As you're uniquely qualified, it sounds like, since you come from the helicopter space and eVTOLs are obviously very similar, but also very different than helicopters. What are some of the biggest differences that set the two types apart from each other? Sure. So there's a few differences, and these differences are what the eVTOL industry is, you know, really pushing as the selling points. So helicopters, you 
they're very complicated aircraft, right? Um, you know, they're they're complicated to build, to maintain, to fly. Helicopters, unlike airplanes, don't like naturally want to fly by themselves. <laughs> so I've I've always thought of helicopters as like this combination of like you know human ingenuity and intuition, just that they exist at all. So they're very expensive just because of the complexity of the design. They have you know critical points of failure, which we've actually seen in some accidents right, uh, recently. You know, if you have a a critical part, like, you know, your your main rotor hub or mast, you know, fly off. That's that's a bad thing. So because you have these critical parts, that's a huge maintenance burden to make sure that, you know, these life limited parts are inspected as they should and replaced as they should be. And they're also noisy, right? Everyone knows that helicopters are incredibly noisy. And that's really been a limiter on, you know, what types of roles helicopters can play in our society because people just hate the noise. And if you, you know, go to New York or Los Angeles, and you really see how much people hate the noise of helicopters. So that's been a big, you know, limit to what roles helicopters can play in our society. So eVTOL aircraft have a number of advantages. Uh, first of all, they're a lot simpler. So, you know, an electric motor is going to be a lot simpler and easier to maintain, easier to build, uh, easier to replace than, you know, a turbine engine, for example. They're going to be quieter because with electric motors, you can have, you know, smaller propellers, you can place them all over the aircraft in different ways, and you can really optimize the design for noise in a way that you can't with a helicopter where you're much more limited in the design. They're going to be cheaper to operate because, you know, you're not going to have all these critical parts and, and the maintenance burden that comes along with that, and you're not going to have jet fuel. So that's another an advantage. And put these all together, and this eVTOL industry believes that this enables you know, a much wider use of this vertical lift technology than we've ever been able to see with helicopters. So you've got the ability to, or, or the promise is that there's an ability to operate a helicopter-like vehicle in many more places and in a wider array of functions that, than is currently possible for, for a number of, you know, kind of uh, a number of hurdles that can be overcome. And so what are most of the eVTOL kind of startups or, or manufacturers or whatever we want to call them at this point? Are they looking that these are, we have like the Uber example where you would have passengers or you've got kind of the UPS example where you've got, um, you know, package delivery. Is, is it a combination? Are, are manufacturers trying to do both or, or are different manufacturers focusing on, on different uh, use cases? So it's a bit of a combination, and there's a lot of, of manufacturers focused specifically on one thing. So I think where you get a lot of the hype is all around urban air mobility. So that's the idea that Uber started pushing with its Elevate program. This idea that, hey, we have these really clean, quiet electric vehicles that you know now we can use in cities in a way that we could never use helicopters before. So people can fly around cities you know, at a much higher you know, larger scale than uh, they could ever do with helicopters. So that that urban air mobility mission, this idea of using these helicopter, or, sorry, EV tail aircraft is like rideshare vehicles. That's something that uh, Uber pushed. They believe it could scale to you know this this massive industry, and that's what's been driving a lot of the investment and the hype in the space. So that's what you're hearing a lot about. You know, especially with like the large airline orders, say you know United ordering uh, EV tail aircraft from Archer, you know, to move people between airports and city centers, for example. Then you have some companies like Beta Technologies, which is based in Vermont, which is the one that has the, the contract with UPS. And they're developing, I would say, a much more kind of multi-purpose aircraft. So they uh, do have an urban air mobility customer in Blade, uh, which currently uses helicopters today. But then they also are looking at cargo missions and also some organ transplant missions. So they're working with United Therapeutics, which is their launch customer, to move human organs uh, from United Therapeutics facilities to hospitals so that they can be transplanted into patients. And that's a mission that's done with helicopters today. And it's it's really easy to transfer to an eVTOL because these are typically shorter flights with a, a smaller payload, obviously. So there's a mix of missions that, that people are looking at with this technology. So with all of the the new technologies, electric motors and and the a variety of new technologies that would enable both ur- urban air mobility and then 
outside of that. Has this been kind of a, a challenging landscape? Have we already seen companies drop out of it? Have there been some clear winners so far where, where you're looking at the looking at their their vehicles and, and their production going, yeah, that looks like it might actually work? So I think there's still a lot of churn in the industry at the moment, but I think we're getting uh, you know close to the point where we're going to see a lot more consolidation, and uh, you know we're going to start seeing some of those winners pull ahead. And actually, this week I would say you know a front runner in the the EV tall industry, Joby Aviation, they uh, announced a major milestone in that they completed a flight of over 150 miles with their EV tall prototype, which is uh, you know really serious range. It's their target range. In actual operations, so they're a company that's focused on this urban air mobility mission. They're looking at much shorter average flights of around 25 miles. But by having that, you know, 150 mile range, that allows them to do a number of these shorter flights, you know, back to back with rapid recharging and really, you know, Ha- provide a useful service. So, yeah, I would say, you know, Joby, uh, with this milestone, they've definitely established themselves as a front runner. Beta is another company that's been making great progress in flight testing. And, you know, there are a handful of companies that have like really serious aircraft designs and they've been making, you know, great strides in their flight testing. There's a number of other companies that have really promising talent. You know, they've got great teams of engineers. They don't necessarily have their production flying prototypes yet, but there's every reason to believe that they'll get there. And then there's a whole lot of other companies that, you know, really haven't progressed much beyond a concept. I think as time goes on, it's going to be harder and harder for these companies to get the funding that they need and to catch up uh, with some of these leading players. So it kind of seems like now we don't actually know how many of the, these companies are out there trying to, to start up and get in on the EV tall craze. But it sounds like there are quite a number of them. But what I'm not hearing is any traditional airframer getting in on their own. You keep hearing of Embraer Year has partnered with X to develop an EV tall, or Boeing is providing technical guidance on it, or Airbus is doing the same. Why is it that you think that none of the established aircraft manufacturers are, are trying to get on the craze themselves? Well, it's a great question. I think it it's I think they believe that they can afford to like, you know, hold back and kind of see how things develop. You know, certainly Airbus, um they've had a couple of uh, big eVTOL demonstrator programs. They were a leader with the Vahana eVTOL a few years ago, although a lot of Vahana's personnel have since moved on to some of these eVTOL startups, but they're still flying their city Airbus eVTOL demonstrator. So, you know, Airbus may have something cooking behind the scenes. Bell, you know, I think you know, was very enthusiastic about this space a few years ago. They've lost some key personnel, so they've sort of you know put that on the back burner. Boeing has made a kind of all-in bet on Whisk, which is their joint venture with Kitty Hawk, and they're developing autonomous aircraft. So they're you know skipping the pilot, going straight to self-flying aircraft, and it's a kind of a risky bet because uh, you know it's really not clear when regulators will certify autonomous aircraft to, to carry passengers. Passengers. I think if you, you talk to the startups, I mean, they would argue that maybe these established legacy airframers, you know, are too conservative and and don't have uh, the vision. Although, you know, I do have to give credit to, to Embraer. They're, they're definitely pushing very hard in this space and they have some very ambitious plans and looking forward to seeing them unveil their aircraft soon. So I, I wanted to talk about the the technology a little bit, and we we've talked about electric motors being more simple than a traditional helicopter. But when we talk about electric aircraft, we're obviously talking about batteries, and so I was wondering how the the eVTOL startups or, or manufacturers that we're talking about have looked at the battery problem because obviously they don't have the we talked uh, two episodes ago about the ES19 which obviously has a range issue and then a recharge issue obviously with, with with UAM especially you don't have a range issue but you do have to recharge the aircraft are they looking at internal batteries hot swappable batteries what is the kind of guiding guiding technology through the industry or are they all doing something different so you have uh, different companies taking a few different approaches. I would say that range is still actually an, an issue, uh, a non-trivial issue for the urban air mobility mission because vertical takeoff and landing aircraft are so power intensive. So, you know, 
very power hungry uh, if you do these vertical takeoffs and landings. It, it takes a lot of power to hover. So Joby, for example, they've been very adamant that they're using, you know, a battery technology that's commercially available today. Um, some companies are experimenting with, uh, you know, more advanced, less proven battery chemistry. And everyone's being very, very quiet, very stealthy, I would say, about their particular approach to, to battery development because it is such a critical piece of intellectual property. So, you know, again, that's something that really has to be be demonstrated in flight testing exactly how far these these aircraft will be able to get. And uh, it's uh, it's an exciting aspect, I think, of the technology because, uh, you know, it is such a hard problem and there are so many people, you know, really working on it uh, and some crossover from the electric vehicle space as well. So, yeah, different approaches. Everyone's uh, keeping fairly quiet about exactly how they, they plan to tackle this problem. Everyone's making big promises and we'll see how that shakes out. <laughs> you mentioned in discussing kind of where the, I guess, traditional airframers are on thing, the regulatory hurdles for for unpiloted passenger carriage. But what about just the regulatory hurdles in general? I mean, it, as far as I know, we don't have a rubric for certification for eVTOLs yet, do we? Correct. So that's something that is in development. And, you know, I would say that the eVTOL companies are very optimistic about how quickly they'll be able to establish this framework. I think anyone in legacy aviation is very pessimistic, you know, probably based on their own experience with the regulators and how long it can take to enact even, you know, fairly minor rule changes. But, you know, both the FAA and EASA and some of the other regulators around the world are actively working the problem. And you have some different approaches between the FAA and EASA. So in the FAA, they're using Part 23 rewrite to um, push some of these projects through. So of course, when Part 23 was rewritten to a performance-based standard, that opened the door to you know really novel aircraft because they no longer had to meet these prescriptive standards in the previous regulations. So a lot of the uh, eVTOL developers in the United States are pursuing certification you know, under Part 23 with special conditions that are being defined by the FAA. In Europe, uh, EASA has taken a different approach. They have you know, really been seeking to establish a, a very clear framework for certifying eVTOL aircraft. Uh, so they have what they call a special condition VTOL that, you know, seeks to, you know, kind of really lay out very specific guidelines for, for these eVTOL developers and specific targets for, for safety. So, and, and EASA is shooting for a higher level of safety as well in terms of, of you know, system safety and, and component failure rates. So there's still a lot of harmonization that needs to be done between the regulators and uh, still a lot of work that needs to be done before you know we actually get to exactly how these aircraft will be certified. What are some of the other hurdles, not necessarily for the the aircraft themselves, but for everything else? Because I'm just thinking, I'm based in Chicago. So I'm thinking about, we have the, the vertical I, I forget exactly what it's called, but it's basically the place where all of the helicopters that can fly into downtown operate. It's one place, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And that doesn't make anything more accessible for anyone or, or kind of further the promise of, of being, you know, eight people being carried around the city, you know, close to a building, landing pretty close to where you want to go and things like that. So has there been any industry-wide discussion or or even specific examples of saying, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to get people that live and work in the cities and regulators of those cities involved. Yes. So that's a, a big issue. Uh, certainly there's a lot of work being done on that issue. Um, you know, a lot of these eVTOL developers, they, uh, they have huge policy teams now that are actively working this issue. But that's something that still needs to you know, really be proven. So the idea is that with these eVTOL aircraft, because they're so much quieter than helicopters, people are going to tolerate them you know, landing in these neighborhoods, uh, city centers, and so forth, where they don't tolerate helicopters helicopters today. So that's the argument, but you know, that still needs to be proven. There there's a big <laughs> but there. Uh, yeah. It's, it's big. Yeah, and you know, of course, you know, to to make this a viable service, you know, these vertiports, I think it's also called the Chicago vertiport. Yeah, it, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, yes. 
they need to be in locations that are convenient, right? Because, you know, as you start adding more modes, if you have to take an Uber to get to your vertiport and then take another Uber to get to your destination, you know, the the big advantage of flying is time savings. And a, the more modes you add to that trip, you know, the, the more you're cutting into the time savings. So being able to establish these convenient vertiports, that's going to be huge. And companies are taking different approaches. So again, I won't go back to Joby because they've uh, announced some, some things around this. They're working with uh, Reef, uh, which is like a parking garage company, you know, to explore placing parking or vertiports on the roofs of some of these parking garages. There's the idea of using some of these smaller airports that are more conveniently located. A lot of people are exploring different ideas, but it still needs to get past the communities that are, are going to be hosting these aircraft. And I haven't seen a ton of community engagement yet. So that's going to be a, a big hurdle for the industry and, and definitely a big check on whether the urban air mobility industry is going to be ex- able to expand the way everyone hopes. Yeah, I definitely foresee a a chicken and egg situation where infrastructure wise, where you're not going to want to build the infrastructure until the technology is proven and you can't really prove the technology until the infrastructure is in place to actually operate it. At least here in New York City, we have three heliports scattered throughout Manhattan, but you can't just plop down a helicopter on any given building. It doesn't work that way here. So it would be quite a feat to to build out these places where EV tall aircraft can land and take off and operate from. Since some of these heliports, they're all along the river because that's where they're allowed to operate to. So there's going to be a lot of community engagement to uh, on where to put these places. Because if I were uh, a, a homeowner, I probably wouldn't want one of these vertiports in my backyard. Yeah, certainly if, you know, your primary association with, you know, vertical lift aircraft is with helicopters. I think that's why you're going to see some of the earliest routes in urban air mobility uh, being from airports to, you know, city centers or places where there's already, say, those established helipads. So, you know, again, like in New York City, you have Blade offering a service from some of these helipads to the airport. Well, you can replace the helicopters with EV tall aircraft that can be a easy way to kind of introduce communities to these electric aircraft, demonstrate that they're quieter. And of course, on the airport side, you don't have to to worry about the community acceptance because you already have aircraft landing there. So that might be a, a way to kind of slowly build up these urban air mobility systems. But, you know, definitely community acceptance is, is the big unknown in this equation. Are we able to quantify how much quieter these aircraft are? Because certainly a, a small drone is is much quieter than a helicopter, but they're really annoying. Like the noise that they make is really annoying. And so I'm thinking like it's an electric motor. Does it sound like a small drone, just a lot bigger? So uh, that's a big question too. And, and it really varies by aircraft. So the fact that it's possible to optimize these vehicles for noise doesn't mean that everyone is optimizing them. So you'll see some of these early prototypes, especially, you know, they really do sound like big drones and it's really obnoxious. And, you know, it's pretty clear that communities are not going to tolerate that. Some of the more advanced companies have spent a lot of effort, you know, really, really optimizing their, their rotor system for propulsion systems to, to get the aircraft not only quiet from a decibel level, um, but also with respect to the character of the noise to make sure it's not obnoxious in the way that drones are or are in the way that helicopters are today. I mean, I, yeah, I just, like like Jason said, it, it, it seems like a real chicken egg situation where, where people aren't going to want them in their neighborhood to really take advantage and like take full advantage of the promise of the technology until they know it doesn't bother them. But how are they going to know in, until, you know, they're there? Yeah. So interestingly, Mark Moore, who uh, was a former NASA engineer who was strongly associated with Uber Elevate, he recently started a new company that just came out of stealth called Whisper Arrow. So he and uh, Ian Villa, his partner, they have uh, a technology that they claim will make not only large EV tall aircraft, but small drones much quieter and more acceptable to the communities. So I think that's a really exciting company to watch. And if they can deliver on their promise, uh, then, you know, making that technology available to multiple vehicle developers could go a long way to increasing public acceptance. Yeah, I remember a, a few months ago, Joby 
pushed uh, a video on social media where the aircraft uh, actually took off behind the CEO as he was speaking. And a lot of people remarked that was the first time they had actually heard unaltered audio of the aircraft taking off because in every promotional video, there's obnoxious music going on in the background and they, they drown out the audio of the actual aircraft taking off. So there is also... I mean, hats off to, to Joby for publishing that video, but most of the others, you're never going to find a video right now of just the aircraft taking off, making noise. So there's definitely a lot of these manufacturers or hopeful manufacturers literally covering up the audio of how loud these aircraft are, which leads me to believe they don't want you to know how loud they are just yet. But a few of them have published videos like Joby, and I, I hope that becomes more common so we can actually hear what these things sound like. That's absolutely the case. I will say this week is significant uh, for the eVTOL industry as well, because at Oshkosh, uh, two eVTOL uh, companies made flight demonstrations. So Volocopter, the German multi-copter developer, they flew one of their Volocopter prototypes at Oshkosh on Tuesday. And then Opener, which is developing the personal black flight eVTOL, which is super cool, uh, they did a public demonstration with two of their aircraft as well. So we're finally getting to the point where some of these companies are actually doing public demonstrations and letting people hear for themselves, you know, what it sounds like. And I think those, you know, public demonstrations of actual aircraft and not just video, it's going to be really critical to, you know, proving that, yes, these aircraft are as quiet as we say they are, or maybe not. And and, you know, letting people decide, hey, is this acceptable and something you want in your community? Yeah, I'm just going through uh, some social media now looking at uh, the videos posted at Oshkosh. Specifically, I'm looking at the Volocopter one, if that's how you pronounce it. And uh, that thing is not quiet taking off, but it's notable in that that's the only video I can actually find of that aircraft that doesn't have music overlaid on top of it. So that, that's great that they were, were finally starting to literally hear these things for the first time. But there's, uh, there's some room for improvement. I mean, this thing, the Volocopter has how many rotors on top of that thing? 18. <laughs> 18. That's, um, that's a lot of potential noise. It is. And, uh, you know, again, I think the noise is going to be a big issue. And and because the eVTOL designs are still so diverse at this stage, I mean, you know, there's a lot of different designs out there and different concepts. So the, the industry really hasn't, you know, converged on one design. We're going to see a lot of variation in, in the noise. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that affects their chances of success, you know, specifically in this urban air mobility mission. Yeah, that's an absolutely fantastic point that right now, I feel like we haven't had this inflection point in the aviation space in a long time. Like everyone knows what an airplane looks like. It has two wings, some number of engines, and a tail. This space, the the design of the aircraft is is not to be punny, but it, it's up in the air. Nobody knows what these things look like, and they're all radically different. Do you have any inkling on, on which design you think is, is really going to be the, the front runner, or is it just too soon to know what these are going to look like? Um, it's too soon for me to, to place any bets on, you know, what they'll ultimately converge to be. So, you know, certainly Joby, I, I mean, they're a front runner flying their aircraft long distances. It's a, a very efficient design uh, and they're, they're accomplishing, you know, a lot with it. I think it's probably going to do very well in early missions. But then you have to look at like, well, as battery technology improves, uh, what's that going to enable? So I'm not sure if you've seen the Lilium aircraft out of Germany. It's a very sleek, slick looking aircraft. And it's it's gotten a lot of shade, <laughs> you know, among the experts because it has a very high disc loading. It's going to be very power hungry. And a lot of people doubt, you know, will its batteries really be able to meet these performance targets that it's promising? Maybe not with near-term battery technology, but, you know, as battery technology improves, then that could enable some of these, you know, sleeker, you know, more stylish designs let us say <laughs> that, you know, might be appealing to the public as well. So uh, I'm not really sure where, the, where this industry is going to end up. Well, if my iPhone is any indication, battery technology is not improving at all. In fact, it's actually getting worse. <laughs> I was going to ask with the variety of designs, is there a, a sweet spot as far as passenger numbers or cargo capacity that all of these companies are targeting? Or is that also all over the map? 
Well, it can't be too far over the map because battery technology is still limited, right? So, you, you know, there's there's a few companies out there talking about how they're they're going to have like 40 passenger EV tolls. No one thinks that's remotely oh, possible okay. in the near yeah. term. Yeah, no. <laughs> so you're seeing most uh, aircraft developers going for anything from, you know, the single seat personal EV tolls, uh, like, you know, with the open or black fly to two seat designs like Volocopter, the, the multi-copter or, you know, Kitty Hawk uh, is developing a, a two seat aircraft. Joby and a lot of its direct competitors are, you know, looking at like the five seat range. And then Lilium is kind of an outlier in that it's pursuing a commercial design with seven seats. So that's really, I would say, the, the biggest or the, uh, the largest EV toll that we see, you know, among serious players right now. Do you see this technology? I mean, you come from a helicopter background. Do you see any of this technology kind of moving into the helicopter space to further helicopter development kind of separately from the the EV tall specific? I do. And so I see a, a couple of interesting ways that it's likely to affect the helicopter industry. So first of all, I think these aircraft, the EV tall aircraft, are going to be much better than helicopters for certain missions, you know, at the low end of performance. So tourism flights, for example, like how great would it be to have a, a quiet aircraft to say fly over the Grand Canyon or fly over Hawaii or, you know, some of these sites where people are very sensitive to noise and where the noise of a helicopter, you know, kind of disrupts the experience of this natural environment. I think that's a great application for EV tall aircraft. And then, of course, some of these, you know, shorter distance charters that, uh, you know, fall into the urban air mobility category. There's a little bit of that being done with helicopters today that could be done much more efficiently with some of these aircraft. Helicopters are always going to be more efficient with hovering. So for anything that needs like, you know, sustained hover time or, you know, longer range, or if you're flying a lot of people out to an offshore oil rig, you know, helicopters are going to be where it's at for quite some time, I would think. But a lot of the autonomy technology that's being developed uh, with these eVTOL aircraft I can see, you know, flowing back into to helicopters as well. I feel like I know a lot more about EV tolls now than I did when we began, but I also feel like I've gotten to the point where I need to learn a whole lot more to have any handle on how this is going to go over the next one, five, ten years. Yeah, I think I need to start actually paying a little more attention to the space because right now I've kind of disregarded it as a pipe dream. But it seems more realistic than not. It's, it's interesting because I think we're all still learning and watching where this space is going to go. And, you know, that's exciting for me, like as a reporter and as a pilot as well, seeing all this ne new technology being developed, watching how it evolves, seeing how it's going to change the industry. And yeah, but there's a lot we don't know still and a lot that's going to be revealed in, in coming years. So I'm I'm excited to, to see where it goes to. I would encourage you to to come check out evtall.com. So we're, we're covering it quite closely. Alan Head, the editorial director of evtall.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Folks, we will put a link in the show notes to a, a fantastic piece, kind of a, a primer of the, of the whole evtall industry at the moment into the show notes so that you can go check that out. We've had a chance to look at it and it's a really, really great basics and overview and something that I'm sure that I'm going to be referring to for a long time to come. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Welcome back. And as Jason mentioned before we spoke with Alon, you might want to pay attention and we are definitely paying attention now. Yeah, we're, we're going to regroup in 2024, which is the golden year where everyone says these things are going to enter service. And we're going to – let's listen back to episode 122, 122 in the future and say, wow, we were way off or wow, we, we, we nailed it. 2024 was, was – uh, the year it all happened. And whether or not it happens, we'll be sure to talk about it here. This has been episode 122 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here as always with Jason Rabinowitz. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.